Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 208 for Monday, April 22nd, 2019. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast that is by, for, and about gigging, working musicians, weekend warriors, we like to say, here in Durham, New Hampshire. I had to think about that for a second. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Los Gatos, California, it's Paul Kent. Why'd you have to think about it? I don't know. It's earlier in the day than I usually podcast. Maybe that's the reason. <laughs> Are know. you usually in a different place earlier in the day? No, no. I mean, not, not you know, metaphorically, sure. Yeah, that's that what I'm thinking. Places. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about things differently. I, I mentioned that we got this new mixer and uh, I realized after we recorded our last show that the mixer has more outputs than uh, than it than the previous one, which means like more outputs from the computer can be accepted by the mixer. So now instead of having to route your outbound audio from like Discord through another device to plug in analog to the mixer, I can send you straight to a channel on the mixer. It's actually like, you know, it's just more efficient. I like mm, cool. Yeah, so I like those things. Oh, you know. hey, speaking about mixers, uh, yeah, Bill and I are pulling the trigger and we're going to buy that Midas rig. The the whatever 32, the X32 yep. family. Oh. Yep. Dude, I, I think you're going to be really happy that that Midas is what we use in uptown. I mean, we, you know, it is the ubiquitous mixer these days. It really has become it's everywhere. I mean, yeah. and you know, the idea about walking in with a thumb drive of a, of a scene ready to go, you know, that you've taken from yours when you've got it dialed in and given it to someone else is a pretty good feature. It, it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Are you going to um, are you taking it to like that next level? Like like uh, I mean, several listeners have written in about it, but uh, like Dan Meblin talked about when we interviewed him where it, they they all go in ears and wow. all of that stuff. Or is, is that maybe down the road? No, I mean, our band will never go all in here. OK, I mean, our, our keyboard player, and our bass player will never. Interesting. Will never. Yeah, we'll never go for that. Huh. It's, uh, you know, but it's an interesting thing because I did bring. We, we played a corporate gig a couple of weeks ago and we got another kind of ding about about volume level. And Bill said it actually wasn't that much of a volume level. And this was the gig I was telling you that they'd already been there about three or four hours by the time we played. Yeah. And they weren't that into it once we started and. And, you know, a little bit of an older crowd. And, you know, we were trying to start with some high energy stuff to keep them engaged. And um, but it was another thing about volume. And so we did. Bill actually did a really good job. He just said, listen, guys, you're going to cut yourself off, cut your necks, despite your faces if you keep doing this stuff. So, you know, and then we huh. had the next gig. Was, next gig was not. At, it was just as bad. And then the gig after that, it kind of kicked in. So I think it's a, it's just a weird thing, you know, like. You'd think that there's a personal responsibility switch that says, I'm not going to be the head of this problem. And that must be tempered with the, I'm going to hear myself if I'm going to perform. And so, I'll, you know, I'll take care of me. You guys take care of you. There, it's that balance between those two things. Yeah. You know, not wanting to be the guy who's, who's driving the volume versus, versus making sure you have what you need to perform. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, yeah. It, well, and that's, I mean, we've talked about this recently ad nauseum. Otherwise we'd talk about it again, but you know, in-ears can be that solution it, but they are not a turnkey solution in terms of solving that problem. Right. Because you have to get to the point where you're comfortable with in-ears and, and perhaps even to the point where you prefer them to yeah. stage wedges. And, and that's, an evolution, especially for those of us that started in a day when in-ears were not a thing. Like it, it killed me the first gig I set my daughter up with some in-ears that, you know, that we were playing because we were both playing the gig and I had my rig set up and it was like, well, it's easier than dragging a monitor over here for you. And and I'm like, man, here she was whatever, like maybe 16 years old or something. It's like you're already getting to do this. Like it, I was in my thirties before that was a reality. For sure. Yeah. Our horns love it because our horns don't really care what else is happening on stage. They're reading down a chart and they're just worried about time and hearing themselves for intonation. Sure. Hearing each other for intonation. Right. Yep. Yep. So they don't really care what the guitars are doing and you know, that type of stuff. They're, you know, they're, they're more trained to just like, we're reading down a chart. That's what we're playing. Yes. Uh, and uh, and they get enough bleed where they listen to any kind of audibles or you know left turns oh, that the songs might take. Sure, or stuff. sure. But yeah, I don't know. Um, the last gig we did was actually quite good, quite comfortable. That's good uh, from a volume. So so 
the guy. It is a solvable there. problem. In ears aren't the only solution to this, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we got a question about about um, about amp models and simulators, right? Yeah, we did. We did. Why don't you read, why don't you read that question? All right. Okay. Wait, we we are. Bra- you know what? I'm I'm going to. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to read Matt's question only because oh. only because that is the question that we've been putting off and putting off and promising. And we promised we would start this episode with it. So, you know, here we are. Uh, We'll start, we'll start there. Then we'll, we'll yeah, yeah, then we'll, then we'll go to the the next one. Of course. Yeah. 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 We'll make this a uh, listener feedback show. That's, that's, it's good. So, and it, for those of you that want to participate in that uh, feedback at giggabpodcast.com, or you can find us on Facebook at giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook. And and so however you want to find us, we love to hear from you. And really it, it, it means a lot when we do. Okay, now Matt says, um, I was listening to an older episode regarding iPads on stage and your preference for what seems like having all songs memorized or off book. Just out of curiosity, how many songs do you guys have memorized? I'm in a group where we have 130 plus tunes and the iPad is definitely a help for chord changes and lyrics. Maybe you could revisit this issue on a future podcast. Yeah. So... This is an interesting one, right? Because I've been thinking a lot about this. As soon as you have the iPad, that crutch, it's really hard to get rid of it. But I rewind a few years to where uh, Fling, we had a song, you know, we were playing more, far more regularly than we are now. It was, you know, probably three times a month kind of thing. And Aaron would bring his iPad, our keyboard player, but he was pretty good at keeping it like, you know, reined in. If you didn't know he had the iPad, it wasn't necessarily obvious, you know. He's a keyboard player. Because he's a keyboard player. Correct. Right, right. Yeah, so he's, yeah. he's already behind like a, one or two keyboards? Yeah, he's right. Yeah. He's got, a, a, a you know, a station set up. Similar to me right. at the drums, right? I can I can hide an iPad in and most people won't even realize that it's there if right. I have it like clipped to my hi-hat off to my left or whatever. But um, yeah, so he would have his, he had charts for a long time. He had a book and then he moved it to the iPad, which, you know, was great. But other than that, um, everybody else was off book and we had a, a song list that was over a hundred tunes mm-hmm. and we all knew them well enough. I mean, there were some train wrecks. Like there's a reason that we stopped playing the cars, uh, just what I needed after I, I pulled the plug on it. I mean, we played it through, but I pulled the plug on it for future set lists. After we played it in no less than three different keys simultaneously. <laughs> and it was like, okay, so this is the re this, here's the cost of not having, you know, sheet music on stage. <laughs> like, you know, we had, hadn't been that long since we'd played the tune, but long enough, you know? Um, so we had some, some casualties along the way with that, but you know, like it worked out better. And I think fling, I, I'll, I'll say this out loud. I think fling was a more interesting band live when we didn't have, you know, as many as five iPads on stage. I generally with Fling, I don't need one except to, you know, have a control over the mixer or whatever if we're if we're running our own sound. But mm, a few of the other guys now have them and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah you, you know, it's it, it's not a good look, I don't think. It's not a good look. So I have seen this topic come up regularly on, on other cover band discussion boards. Yeah. And- and, you know, it, it is clearly a thing, right? Yep. And it's one of those things where the technology is cheap-ish, you know, accessible, easy, and it's just, it's easy to kind of put it in there. And I would say that, uh, you know, in my band, you know, the horns read charts. I push them every year to memorize more charts. Um, and, you know, and I do this by saying, all right, for this part of the show, you're going to come to the front of the stage. You got to know the part, right? Yep. And so every year I try and push that. But, you know, basically we do have 200 songs plus in our book and, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's quite a bit. And, and uh, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. And it's a five piece horn section. And like we talked, you talked about your, your horn player, you know, last week who was kind of, you know, yeah. able to either loosely know or, or tightly know most songs. It's hard when you trying to have five guys harmonizing like that. Absolutely. So, oh, yeah, yeah, so. yeah. No, it, he, he definitely, you know, uh, yes, he was he was a one man show. So he had some yeah. some flexibility there, of course. Yeah. yeah. Now, that said, um, Nick is behind two keyboards. He has an organ on top and a, an electric piano on the on the bottom. And he has a small seven inch pad. Yep. That is tucked away. You can't see it. And he's also extremely conscious about just glancing at it for a cheat. And that's actually the one of the main points I'm going to make as, as we get uh, I was just going to say, he is he is very good at not yeah. forgetting to engage the crowd. 
Like he understands his prime directive. Yeah. Yes. That's the thing. And, you know, we've talked a lot about shoegazing musicians and, 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 uh, people who love to play, but they're really not comfortable as a performer. And, um, and you had said, you know, the, you use the word crutch. And, and I think that all these things are what kind of come into play, uh, is that you, any moment you are on your pad, you are not engaging with the crowd. Some are better than others. Some literally can just grab a word to make sure that they're right and, you know, keep it trucking. And yep. keep, keep it trucking. Many are not. I tend to find more often. Now, again, there's different situations. All, you know, t- to be quite honest, I bring a pad for my acoustic gigs because I like to be able to go into all, about a thousand different ways. But I have the internal monologue all the time. Like, wouldn't it be better to just play a show and never have to? And it is. I mean, my, my acoustic, solo acoustic shows are better when I'm off book, when I'm just, you know, into the song and into the audience and that type of thing. Of course. It yeah. looks horrible, you know, to be there up on stage and to see a guy reading you know, a song. Yep. And I, and it takes away from the moment of, of, so it really is, depends what you want. Is it a casual gig where, you know, you're trying out material and you're, you know, it, the vibe supports that, or is it a paid corporate gig or is it a, you know, a, a nightclub gig? I, I just think emphatically these things have, where I started was that these things are relatively inexpensive, relatively easy to, you know, to put into use. And, and they're so handy. Many people do. Like, and I mean, they're, they're handy. They're, that's they the are. problem is they do actually help. Mm. <laughs> they, well, well, they help, but then they hurt, right? But they so, hurt. Correct. And, yeah, and, exactly. And what we're doing yeah. here is that thing. We're yeah. kind of rationalizing. Like, Absolutely. You know, well, it's like, it, like in a you rehearsal. Pay money, in a you rehearsal. Paid money, go ahead. Sorry. If you paid money to go see someone play music and they were on book, uh, you know, a measurable part of the show, would you feel like, you know, dude, now I've seen pro artists you know i've seen ryan adams has a music stand with lyrics you know in case he decides to dig deep into his catalog he's somewhat innocuous about it and he definitely is a good enough performer where he's you know where he again he's just stealing a glance to to get over a phrase or something like that um but if you need i would say this we have 200 songs and we are constantly going back and picking some stuff out of the archives just to see how it feels sure there's also an incredible amount of um reward to letting the muscle memory kick in, remembering a song, finding your way. I mean, again, that, that's also part of your ear training, right? Yes. You know, being able to listen. I mean, it's in there. And, you know, uh, yeah. So we did, uh, we had a re- request for uh, I Feel Good from James Brown, right? Sure. We haven't played it in 10 years probably, right? And uh, and uh, Steve, our bass player, great musician, called out the key, you know, played a little bit of the riff. Yep. And, uh, and then we were in it. I have to say that's incredibly satisfying. You feel very, you feel like oh, a musician. I, I love those right? moments. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You feel like a musician. That's a great way of saying it. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing a thing here. Yeah, I'm exactly. Playing, I'm creating music, not yeah. reading down, you know, word for word notes or, or charts or chords and, and that type of thing. So well, and you're having fun I too. I would say in general. Like, yeah. yeah. It depends on, depends on the vibe, on the vibe and be realistic with yourself about it. You know, how well, it, how much it depends on the vibe. Be, I mean, be, be honest and don't rationalize it. Yeah. Any, mo- any moment with your eyes on your pad is not, is a moment with our eyes, not on connecting with the audience. Um, and I find it even matters. a problem, like with the mixer, uh, you know, the way our mixer works and, and the, the one you talked about, the Behringer, I guess most of them would be this way is if the pad is off, there is a path that needs to be taken to get to that interface. Right. And especially at the beginning of the show, it's like, I need to have that thing up. If there's some feedback or something we did not account for and we're doing our own sound, like I need to be able to dive at that thing and press a button. So I leave the, you know, the image and the the Mm -hmm. app up live on the screen and I keep it dark and all that stuff, but I will catch myself staring at the meters and it's like, Oh, this is like, I think you said once upon a time, I think you said they, the light that comes off them light, light is horrible for pictures. And, and you know, we live in a world of social media where people taking your picture all the time when you're performing, Yep, it looks horrible in pictures. And so I would say there's more downside to it than there is upside. And, you know, we just find our way because you can, you know, but isn't it great to be able to dig out any of 200 songs in a moment? Yeah. But um, but you know. you're only going to play 25 songs in a night or, or 35 or, you know, however long your gig is like you, yeah. you could, you know, even if you wanted to have 50 songs for a 35 song gig, which is a, a long gig, that's three sets, right? You could have 45 tunes ready 
and give yourself some flexibility or whatever. And it's like, that's not that many tunes. It, it, you know, you probably know them already. And, and that's the thing about having the pad is the crutch is it's, you don't realize that you actually know these tunes because you, you'll never get the opportunity to prove that to yourself one way or the other, you know, exactly. unless, unless you do it. I will say, I think I'm, I'm in total agreement. You know, the less we have them on stage, the better, but I will say that as a working musician in today's world, having an iPad or some kind of tablet that can read PDFs is critical. I, I mean, it's a hugely helpful thing for rehearsals and all of that, being able to show yeah. up at a rehearsal and have the same chart as everyone else, right? Like you, there's no question. We didn't have to print a million things and where did it go? I lost it. It got, you know, coffee spilled on it or beer or whatever. Like, you know, like that, all that stuff just goes away as soon as you have this, this tablet, you know, and that's super helpful. And that's the problem. <laughs> it's, it's like, aha, uh -huh, yeah. I could have this over there too. Oh, you know? Yeah. Well, but, and then in, in a band situation it gets to be like, well, you're most exposed if you're like a front man or or, sure. or a guitarist, right? But the keyboard player can actually hide his and the drummer can actually hide behind his kit. Yep. And it's like, well, why can they have them and I can't have them? And then you get into that kind of democratic bickering. That, uh, yeah, always but because the reality is that because he can have it, like it, it works in his scenario. It doesn't work in your scenario. You hang 10 off the end of the stage and look good. Like that's part of your job. Yeah. But, but, the, but the drummer with these it. Conversations yeah. Is always that the value of being a prepared ear ready, you know, focused on the audience musician. Like I said, I, I use it for acoustic gigs and I kick myself every time I do it. And, and sometimes I pull up, I find I pull up charts that I don't really even need. Of course. It's crutch, yep. Right. Yep. And so I, I would say that the net net is, it is there is very rare that someone can use it in an unobtrusive way. And still stay focused on the audience and, you know, get accomplish both things, the crutch and the yep. and the not not missing a moment. But um, I'm pretty but, good with it, but I'm not I know that I'm not perfect. Like it's it's much better. I can hide it. Uh, but if I have it, I will look at it more than I need to and certainly more than I should be. I, in fact, I'll, I'll take this and, you know, zoom up a little bit. Anything that is going to distract you from, you know, delivering to the audience should be thought about. Right. And, yes. and, and from a drummer standpoint, that might mean, you know, do you like to have a symbol right in front of your, between your head and the audience so they can't see your face like that. That also is a thing that's now impacting your ability to connect or their ability to so connect true. with you. Like sometimes, and I find this where it's like, Oh, I got to move that symbol. You know, otherwise I'm, I'm hidden here from the majority of the people. And there's always going to be somebody like some angle that's bad. Right. But you know, you try and maximize it out. And, and I have moved symbols around and, and, you know, designed my kit in a way that I can be seen. Like, you know, that's, that's part of what people, that's why they're not pressing play on the, exactly. you know, <laughs> it's like, it's exactly. just, it's just how it goes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I, yeah, think about, really think about it from that standpoint, you know, what's your show and now go do that and, and be intentional about it. Yeah. Live music. Is a visual art. It is. It is. Yeah. It's live art. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. All right. Well, we've beat that one to death. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's go. Let's go to Eric. It is amazing how many people are talking about that. That it comes up over and over and over. Yeah. And you know, people get used, they like their crutches and, and, of course. Uh, and they find ways to rationalize using their crutches. Same. I, I will find ways to rationalize it too, even though we're having this conversation. I mean, it like, uh, you know, it's like when we did Hedwig, uh, they said you need to be off book. And that was one of the reasons I said no at, at first, you know, it's like, Oh, I can't be off book for this by, you know, given everything else I have going on in my life. And, uh, and then they were like, okay, you can use a pad. Now that gig, there was, I wasn't reading like there were, there were no written parts unless I wrote them. Right. Yeah. It was following chord charts at best. Really. It was just following lyrics. We didn't even have chord charts. So, um, but I had some notes like, you know, you got to stop after beat three on this song because everybody else is going to, you know, <laughs> those mm. kinds of things. And, 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 you know, you wind up reading the lyrics while they're being sung. And it's like, no, sure. this isn't good. All right. Moving on to Eric. Eric asks, he says, uh, I've been noticing a few instances. Uh, oh, wait, wrong one. Wrong one. Wrong one. Uh, he says, uh, like Dave. 
I do uh, some theater work, mostly school productions. But last year I landed some work uh, at a theater group local to me. And that led me to start thinking about something that I, ho- I hope echoes with Paul. He says, these days, the guitar community has seen a huge uprising in digital gear, more specifically ways of eliminating the actual amplifier between the Kempers and the Axe FX to the Helix and the new HX Stomp. He says, there are a lot of th- options to choose from. And he says, I love my amps, but with an awesome overdrive, it's one of those guitar sounds that gets me excited to play. Maybe I'm just a traditionalist, but I've never had an urge to go this route before. Fast forward to January. He's doing a run of Mamma Mia, and I'm going to paraphrase here. He said, but the sound guy asked uh, if he could go direct. Um, He says, I wanted to make everyone happy. So I tried running my guitar into a board in a DI box and then fed that to the house with my own amp on uh, in the pit, essentially just for monitoring. In theory, it wasn't what I preferred, but it worked. It says, until we were well into the first act and my signal all of a sudden started cutting in and out. An engineer, I am not, he says. Mm-hmm. Uh, he says, so I can't tell you why this happened, but I feel like the single signal simply wasn't strong enough to be run out of the box into the amp, out of the direct box, I guess. Huh. He says, to my knowledge, it was fine, fine out front, but who knows? He says, bringing it back around, uh, I decided to look into sort of some sort of digital option. Uh, and he says uh, he's looking at the Atomic Amps Firebox, the Amplifier Box, I guess is what they call it. And uh, he says it's the size of a pedal, has the ability to go uh, into software to edit different amp models and has both XLR and quarter inch outs that can be run individually or together. He says, I haven't dove too deep into it yet, but I found a clean amp sound that I like and I can run my board into it. And it says, uh, but you can you can get real into it and set up presets for different sounds and all that stuff. He says, I like compromise, so I was willing to check this thing out and currently have four shows coming up that hopefully I can put it into action. But I'm curious what you guys think. So I'll put a link to this amplifier box that he got in the in the show notes uh, yeah. so we can all check it out. But it, yeah, so I'm curious as to your thoughts on this, Paul. So um, my, my line has been moving. So I have, uh, I've had a couple of these over my life. The most recent is this, is Vox makes one called a Tone Lab. And it sure is fun to play with. I mean, you know, basically you've got all the pedals and you've got, you know, all the amps and, you know, you can really experiment with sounds. It's great um, for that. It's great for bedroom. I've always found it to be weird on stage that I need to move some air uh, in order to kind of, you know, feel connected to my playing. And I wonder if this is very similar in a big sense to in-ears, like, like more and more people are using modeling solutions and, mm. and, you know, getting air off stage and, uh, and getting comfortable with it. So I, I wonder if there's a bit of a kind of a tactile touch to this, you know, there's a thing when you, when you dig in on a tube amp, some of the modeling pedals, you know, uh, um, are better than others in terms of like if you pick harder or, or, or strum harder, you get that kind of response, but yep. a lot of them are really kind of homogenized. And, you know, some of that is just, you know, physics and moving air. So, um, um, but I do think one of the, as we've spoken about in the last two or three episodes, one of the great challenges of our time of keeping live music alive is your ability to plug into almost any situation and volumes, volume specific situations and keeping some semblance of tone at any volume is a tool that you need. And so that's, a, that's an interesting way is, of thinking about it. Like, yeah, yeah, my, because that's coming at it from the very practical. I, I like that, that, yeah, you want to keep your tone it, you have to accept that you're playing at a lower volume. Like if you can't accept that, then then this conversation doesn't go anywhere. Right. But it, when you know that that's what you're going to be doing now, how do I keep some semblance of tone? This might actually be the answer, not the problem. Yeah. Yeah. But it, again, it's a little bit, it's very different because there's, a, there's a, 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 a part of the chain, the tactile part of the chain that, that disappears quite a bit. So, um, but um, I have, you know, we had Dan Meblin on. Dan's using a a uh, Dan's great guitar player um, is using a um, uh, I think he's using the Line Six board. Um, I have another f- friend's band, the Cocktail Monkeys. They went all digital. They're moving no air on stage at all, and um, and they are they feel good about it for their ears. They feel good about it for the 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 quickness of setup. Um, so they're in a good place. I I, I think that it makes sense to. L- like Matt said, he's not an engineer. And so, uh, was it Matt? It was Eric on this one. Eric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Eric. Yeah, that's okay. uh, yeah. um, 
it makes sense to, as a guitar player, to know your tools. And this is one of the tools available to you, I think. I don't think it's, it has to be an either or thing unless you're really that comfortable with it. But um, I do think it's, it's you know, the, the line moves, you know, in, in playing modern music in modern places. Like I said, the technology is amazing. I mean, the model. And- Uh-oh. Hang on one second, folks. I think I lost Paul. All right, Paul is uh, theoretically back here, right? I've got you, Paul. I'm theoretically back. You are back, yes. Okay, Uh, maybe my FireWire routing that I talked about earlier isn't quite optimized yet, the the trials and tribulations of a new mixer. So anyway, you you were saying that this is- I was saying the technology is great. I mean, the ability to model every amp under the sun, every speaker cabinet under the sun, every- every pedal under the sun work with a, with a chain uh, and rearrange things. I mean, I think it's pretty fantastic stuff, but I think I look at it more like it is a, a modern tool that makes sense for, you know, a, a guitar player to have in their, in their arsenal. You might not use it all everywhere all the time, but it certainly makes sense to know that you have one. And actually that's, you know, I have that Vox tone lab. I just throw it in our sound truck. God forbid anything ever should happen to my, to my amp, I've got a backup now without having to carry a backup amp. Nice. Okay. So that's your, that's a really interesting thought that, that, you know, using this certainly as a backup. Okay. Huh. I like that idea. Yeah. But I do think it's, it makes sense in the same way. It makes sense to try and find your way to in-ears. If you're a singer, especially it's going to preserve your voice for years. And so as a guitar player, it's just another tool. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it makes sense, man. I like it. I like it. I like it. All right. Uh, let's see. Where are we on time? Okay. I think the technology gods will keep moving with us here. Um, let's talk about um, a practical one. And then we then we have just a one of these bizarre things that I think you'll appreciate. But uh, listener Chris writes, he says, and, I, and I'm going to put you on the spot again, Paul, with this, uh, although I have my thoughts. Uh, He says, I'm in a band with another guitar player. Sometimes we wind up playing the same thing and I have to work with him to change that. What's your advice for approaching songs to avoid that up front? Wait, wait, playing the same thing, like playing the exact same part, playing the same part. Yeah, I I, I, that and I've seen this happen in bands with with two guitar players where, you know, you come to rehearsal, you bang through the tune or whatever. It's like, okay, great. It's like, wait a minute. We've got the same thing happening here like that's there's a lot of reasons that that's not going to work right strumming patterns might be different but even if they're exactly the same it's like well what why do we need this extra you know what's the reason two different tones once again i'm really i'm really fortunate in that uh simon has an amazing ear right and a really detailed ear and he'll listen you know when we pick a song or suggest a song he'll be like He'll go find, you know, some good stereo representation and he'll go, I, I have the left ear, you have the right ear, or, you know, something like that. So we, yeah. we kind of divide up stuff or, or often, you know, the guy who brings the song in, um, it's his song. So I'll let him play or he'll let me play whatever we want. And yep. then the other guitar player finds his way around that. Right. Yep. We don't do a lot of playing the exact same parts. I mean, I, you know, you, you're playing it in two different parts of the neck or, you know. Yeah. Uh, or, or you're, you know, finding complementary parts or, you know, one guy's. Or one guy like can a, be tacit for a section of a tune too. Like that's okay. Yeah. 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 Simon and I kind of intuitive. We don't actually even talk about it that much except for that. Like I got the left ear, you got the right ear, but like uh, we have more of a problem when there's, we're covering stuff that's one guitar. So like the tower of power stuff, right? Yeah. One guitar and tower of power. So we tend to, um, again, watch what the other guy does. And then one guy will play the, you know, the part is written and one guy will, will either comp or just kind of pick a single note line or something like that, to, you know, to make it interesting. With acoustic guitars, I don't think it's really, I mean, it depends on the style of music that you're playing. But, um, you know, one guy will play cowboy chords and one guy will play kind of like jangly open inversions of chords. And it creates a nice, you know, big soundscape to do things. But I think the answer is to try and, you know, find complementary parts, make it musically interesting. It's not terribly interesting to see two guys, you know, strumming the exact same chord all night long, which sonically, it's not that interesting. Right. Yeah. And, you know, especially if it's a two guitar show, um, you know, two, two, two acoustic guitars, there's so much, you know, room, you know, to explore, you know, again, whether one guy's just playing cowboy chords, and the other guy's playing up the neck in some kind of open, open form, 
uh, and then in electric stuff, just, you know, one guy can pick and one guy can strum or, you know, w- you know whatever the song calls for. But um, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not, you know, it, I guess the argument would be it makes it sound bigger. I suppose that that can happen. And, but I think more is just going to sound muddied because your ability to get exactly the same rhythm when doing that is uh, going to be. It's impossible. Know, like oh, yeah. it, it's hard for the same guitar player to get the same rhythm. Like you go into the studio and you say, okay, cool. I want you to double that. Like, whoa, like <laughs> it, often it can be better to just like digitally copy the track and move it and then shift it, you know, by a little right. bit of time or whatever and chorus it up. But, um, but yeah. And I mean the same with vocals, right? Like when you're singing harmonies, you've got to, if you're going to sing, it, it's certainly unisons, but even if you're singing a harmony, you know, you got to have the phrasing and like, I, yeah, I, I think, and I think that's what Chris was asking, like, and you answered it. Like, how do you, how do you deal with this? He knows he doesn't want the, the, you know, two guys playing the same thing. And I, I, you know, I've watched this in many bands that I've been in and fling is one of them. Uh, oftentimes, it, it, you know, you did well, the big answer is it just takes being intentional, which is what you were saying, Paul, like you got to think about this ahead of time so that it becomes just normal that you wouldn't even consider playing the same thing. And that involves listening, like, you know, like you said, but it, it's okay for like in fling a lot of times, Michael will sit out in the verse. If Russ has the, you know, the rhythm going and it doesn't need something else, sit it out. You know, it helps with volume. It helps with space, yeah. you know, and then we play. Um, and then when the chorus comes in, you know, it's big. Yeah. Yeah. We pl- a good example is Let's Get It On, which is a one guitar song, right? Yeah. And so Simon plays it pretty much straight. You know, we also have Nick who's comping the chords as well on, on, on electric piano. Sure. And so I had to find a part for myself for that. And so I found kind of, you know, just very, very sparse, kind of almost Steve Cropper, like, you know, Memphis Licks type things. Really, really sparse, not to take up all the space in between. And you're, you're absolutely right. Guitar players always feel like they got to play all the time, which is absolutely wrong. I mean, uh, you know, if they're guitar songs, you plow ahead. But when you're adding color to a song that is keyboard based or, or one guitar based, you really, really need to be selective about where you assert your place. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Cool. All right. Um, Peter has a note for us. I, I just here we go. Uh, yeah. He says, uh, I've been noticing a few instances of fans coming to hear my musical act at a restaurant or bar uh, that hosts music and also happens to serve food and beverages. He says, um, then, uh oh, what's, what's, is that extra noise that I'm hearing in the background? Sorry, I was, I'm taking off a wrist brace. Oh, okay. There it is. Yep. I thought That's you were sensitive like, ears, dude. Uh, well, it's, it's these mics, you know, they pick up what's right there. I, I thought you were like eating, like, it was like, it's ah. like crunch, crunch. <laughs> That's funny. Anyway, he says, uh, I've been noticing a few instances of fans coming to see me at restaurants where, you know, music is hosted, but also food and, and beverages are served. Um, and the, the instances that I've noticed, he says, are people coming to these places and then buying nothing in terms of the ven- venues offered food or drink. He says, in a very small number of instances, I have even become aware via management, unfortunately, of fans bringing in their own food and drink. He says, it seems like the former coming, occupying a table, but buying nothing is at best uncool. And the latter bringing your own stuff is a total no, no. Yeah. Uh, He says, what do you guys think? And how would you deal with the situation with the restaurant bar venue and fans? Uh, And he says, for clarity, the venues here are ones that do not offer, uh, do not mandate a cover charge or have a, a two drink minimum or, you know, any sort of purchase minimums. It's just, you know, sort of a nice thing to do. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I We've talked about this over the years about what the so, value yeah. of a fan is, you know, like, it, is it a warm body that you can plausibly claim I brought people or is it, you know, someone that's really supporting your car? And this is kind of where the, the rubber hits the road on that, isn't it? I mean, you know, I, I think it's it's a pretty simple thing. I think I think a performer is in partnership with the venue and needs to say, hey, you know, these people are supporting live music. It's awesome. You know, please, you know, and you do it in your social media posts for your yeah. in advance of your events. And then certainly when you're there, just saying, just want to thank the great people here. You know, please, you know, buy a glass of wine, buy a beer and support this great venue that's supporting live music. I love playing here. And I think that that's got to be part of it. And I think... I th- actually, uh, here's here's the interesting question: Do you say something to the to the fans that actually bring food in? I think you probably might want to. 
Yeah, that's a I weird mean, one because it's not it like you don't want to scold people. But. No, it's not your place either. Like, I mean, truly, it's not your place. But it like it, if venue if I mean, bringing food in, that's just like that goes against so many <sighs> things. Like, it, like what has to like certainly there's places where BYOB, right? And I will be the first to admit that I have been in bands where, you know, we'll bring our own like, you know, food and, and sometimes somebody will bring a beer or two or whatever. And but it like it's known that that's not what the, the venue wants and you know, you should keep that to yourself, but you know, like there, there are those times where, where that actually makes sense. Like if, but, but for someone to like to go see a band and bring my own food or drink. Yeah. It never dawned on me to, to, to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, people, <laughs> but it happens. People, I'm sure. Yeah, it, do, it does happen. And, and, yeah. and, you know, I know, I know Peter and I know some of the fans oh, interesting. that do this. And so, I um, mean, you know, I feel for him because, you know, it's nice to have people who go out of their way to see you. That's a, that's a wonderful thing. But what is the value of a fan, you know, that, uh, and maybe if it's a, if it's a common enough problem, you just have to message it so often, like, Hey, this one is not, you know, no food, no outside food allowed. And you know, that, oh, that's that, true. You could just, yeah, you could say it like it's a thing that, yeah, that's, uh, that's I like rules that idea. Of the house. Yep. Yeah. If you're coming to this one, no outside food. Around. And you know, if people ignore that a couple times, you know, if yeah. you're going to lose the gig because of it, I think you say something, you say, Hey, I'm going to lose this gig. You yeah. Know, Cause no, your fan doesn't want you to lose the gig. And so, um, but I think it's, you know, I, the Guglielmo that we are doing these big winery gigs now. Yeah. We're yeah. ticketed gigs and they specifically say no outside food and no, no outside, they're a winery, no outside wine allowed. Yeah. And so we, we just happily, you know, share that they help police it, you know, um, and I don't think it's probably as, you know, a, a ubiquitous problem for Peter that, you know, a venue would have to. And, you know, I would also talk to the venue and tell the venue, hey, feel free, you know, if people, you know, behave badly. <laughs> yeah, to, right. You know, tell, tell them to behave well. Yeah. Let, you know, and that's even better. Put it on the venue. Right. Now, if the venue doesn't want to do it because it makes them feel uncomfortable about it. I don't think that they would. I would think this is an easy one for a venue to handle. Like, hey, no outside food allowed. That's it. But, yeah, uh, it's a very easy. Right. It's it's not a. Yeah, it's not a judgment yeah. call. <laughs> like but, you can't you know, it, it is a, I think it's important to wrap your head around the idea that a warm body is not necessarily a great fan. Right. You know, as you, as you move up the, it, you know, it's flattering and it's, you know, appreciated. But as you move up the, the, the stratosphere of what is a great fan, you know, someone who comes to see you is awesome. Someone who's willing to pay to come see you is awesome. You know, and then in between that is, you know, someone who comes to see you and brings people and someone who comes to see you and supports the venue so that they'll hire you again. I mean, you, know, right. you really kind of got to be honest about what is a great fan. Right. Yeah. What is right? <laughs> what is a great fan? Yeah. In, in, th in this sense, again, you know, if you're if you're a touring band and if someone sneaks into a show and they get in and, and you know, it, it, it's not your problem, um, you know, you, you're appreciative that someone buys your records, downloads your music, you know, whatever it is, spreads the gospel of how good you are. But um, I think in the case of if you play restaurants, you know, this is a this is a a line that can thou shalt not pass thou shalt not pass i think that yeah that's different it's we're not talking about like you said a big ticketed thing i mean even that it's probably not a line to pass but but different than than this where you are literally taking away the thing that is is what value you should be bringing to the equation yeah yep yeah yeah it's crazy i and i guess you know you could if, if you are forced to have this conversation with people you know just maybe going up to them and and saying like hey i just gotta know you know the management's like freaking out a little bit about this so you guys gotta like keep that stuff you know separate like can't do that here they're you know they're getting pissed at me about it and you just kind of make it a thing make it about yeah. you you in the venue and like hey you're doing me a favor right if if you don't if you don't do this and, and you, again yeah. you appreciate tell me appreciate that they come to see you. yeah of course yeah the goal is to keep them coming to see you right just, you know, right have them buy at least just one cocktail or one beer or something, something like that yeah 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 that's you know if we want live music to continue in these venues you got to support the venues not just not just show up and i think it's important that musicians carry that banner and uh and uh you know and, and mo like you said most people intrinsically get it some people you know, not through evil, not through self-entitlement, just not thinking.
You're right. Just not thinking. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Most people, if, if, certainly if you shine this light on it, you know, in the best way possible, but still shine the light on it. And most people will be like, oh, hey, sorry. You know, uh, wasn't thinking. And, and then yeah. it's all good. Yep. Yep. Crazy, though. I've never had I don't think I've never been made aware of somebody bringing their own food or or drinks to a, a gig like that. That's that's bold. Man. It is bold. <laughs> it is. All right, man. Well, folks, that's what we have for today. It was fun to kind of dig into the mailbag here and uh, and, you know, just good questions. Yeah, very good questions. Keep them coming. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. I really it, it's great. And and we've gotten some notes from from folks, too, just in support of the show and telling us what you like. And, and we read those, too. As you know, we reply to everything that comes in. So, uh, you know, so feel free. We would love to hear from you. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. That's what I got for today. What about you? Are we good, Paul? No, it's like we covered a lot of stuff today. I, so yeah, I agree. Fun. Yeah, cool. Our, our little weekly buddy check-in that we do. It is a good thing. Yeah. Well, keep checking in with us, folks. Tell your friends to check in with us, too. We'd appreciate sharing the love. Giggabpodcast.com. One thing that you can do, though. What's one thing they can do, Paul? They can always be performing. Get your eyes off your pad, damn it. <laughs> 